I'm going to step out here a little after 7.30. So um, would it be okay if I give you and Anna host and co-host? Yes, please. Okay, great. Thank you. You're all set. Thank you, Athena. Good evening, everyone. Welcome. It is March 2nd. Welcome to our regularly scheduled TSO meeting. Uh, we are recording. Pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021 and extended by Chapters 22 and 107 of the Acts of 2022, this meeting will be conducted via remote means. Members of the public who wish to access the meeting may do so via Zoom or by telephone. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time via technological means. So with that, I will call the meeting to order at 7.02 p.m. and make sure everyone uh, can be heard. Uh, Anna. Yeah. Hi. I'm already unmuted. All right. Andy. I'm here. Dorothy. Hello. How are you? Hi, Dorothy. And Shalini. I am here. And Paul, I know you're there and we can hear yes. you. Hello. And hello. And Kelly, Kelly Miller, can you hear us all? I sure can. Thanks for checking. Thank <laughs> you. Thank you for being with us again. Um, and Athena, I know we can hear you. I'm here. Thanks. Okay. So we do not have uh, any town manager appointments this evening. So uh, we will move on. I'm sorry. Excuse me. Um, we're actually going to begin with public comment. So if we have any members uh, with us in the audience now who would like to make a comment, please raise your hand now and you will have the floor for up to three minutes. Okay. I'm not seeing any, so we will move on uh, to approval of minutes from the February 9th meeting. Has everyone had a chance to review the minutes? Okay. I move we approve the minutes of the February 9th meeting. A second. Okay, wonderful. So without further ado, Shalini. Yes. Dorothy. Yes. Andy. Yes. Anna. Yep. Yes. Okay. Sorry, yes. And I am a yes. All right. Thank you. And so now we'll move to uh, Andy. Did you have any an update that you wanted to to give in regards to the uh, proposed water and sewer regulations? Um. Well, the reason I put it on is if necessary is so we didn't know what the discussion was going to be like on Monday. And um, I think that where we kind of left it was, you know, I was happy with it, but it has a big piece and the big that is left open. And I think that the big piece um, is something that this committee might want to take the lead on. And that is that um, it was... Uh, agreed on what was going to be written in the regulation, but there was a, um, also reference made at the council meeting that there would be a motion that would go with the um, regulation, uh, with the proposed regulations that might address some of the concerns that were expressed in the discussions that happened in this committee and in the finance committee. And I think that most of the discussions now, um, because of the vote that was taken by the council, are in the interest of this committee. And that is uh, to uh, try and make sure that we craft a motion that provides for what our expectations are that is going to happen in two years and what information we think that we would suggest staff develop for us over that um, next couple of years so that we um, make sure that we are ready to return to the discussion fully informed 
which was, I think, part of the Finance Committee concern. And Anna and I have had a little bit of an opportunity because of the fact that we're the two who are in the unique position of having been on both committees and still being on both committees to think about that. So I know that Anna has some uh, thoughts whether she wants to share them. I don't know, but her hand is up. Andy, have I ever not wanted to share my thoughts? Um, I Yes, yeah, so Andy and I were able to, to connect really briefly on this today. I'm going to um, work on a motion. We have a little bit of time because we, we want to see what Amy brings back to the council first, but um, probably for our next TSO meeting, I will have a, uh, a motion to bring forward. And, and that gives me time to also work with Athena to make sure it makes sense as a motion. Um, and then what I'll do in the meantime is uh, ask finance if they have anything that they would like to see specifically included in a study and, and what information they would want to see. So I'll include that as well. But ultimately, uh, Andy and I talked that, or, or landed on the agreement that the motion should come from TSO more so than finance. Um, so that said, the same offer, while we will discuss it at TSO, that same offer applies. If, if there are things you'd specifically want to see um, looked at in the next two years regarding uh, water and sewer line ownership, please make sure that you tell them to me. I will do my best to capture what we've discussed, but if there are specific things, please email that to me so I can um, try to include it in, in a motion. Andy, did I miss anything? Yeah, uh, no, you did not, but let me just give one example, and um, that might be helpful to stimulate everyone's thinking about this. Um, we had that correspondence from the one person who lives in the hollows, which is a private road that is off of Old Farm Road. But I don't think it's directly even off of Old Farm Roads. I think that uh, it's off of a road that's off of our Old Farm Road. And all of the roads that are back there um, uh, are um, not public roads. But the uh, so, and so the question is, uh, how do you handle that? And what are the costs now? And what are the costs in the future? And how many sections of town have similar situations? And when I asked Amy that question, unfortunately, you know, within a few days before the council meeting, Amy was. Uh, kind of, I guess you'd say, those are good questions, um, but, uh, and I can get the answers for you. Do you need me to do it? And I kind of said, yes, but I don't see how it's reasonable for you to spend the time on it before Monday, because it's not gonna help that much in the discussion on Monday, and it seems like a lot of work. So that's an example of the kind of thing that I had thought about of my, some others, uh, and uh, it, uh, you know, I don't know if you have any other examples, but that's what I was, the kind of thing that I was thinking of. So I think it's a collective enterprise, and um, Sean had some very definite things in mind when he made the recommendation to delay the implementation of this until, um, 25, we should make sure we understand what it is he was envisioning that we would know and make sure that that's explored. So those are the kinds of examples I was thinking of. And I am going to ask people just so that I can keep everything straight. I'm happy to hear them now, but please also email them to me so that I have them in text in one place. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Dorothy, hand us up. Uh, yes, um, probably I, Paul can answer this. The question of private roads, um, I don't really know what that means. I assume that if you buy a house or build a house on a private road, you know it's a private road. So that's not going to be a surprise. Um, I don't know what it means to do that. It's something I never have done. Um, I don't think it follows automatically that we assume to do this or that um, because there must be some practice about private roads. So like, what does the town services, does a town normally provide people on a private road? Except that they don't pave it. They don't pave the road. Isn't that what it means? Yeah. Yeah, so it's, there's no, um, 
the town is supposed to be responsible just for public ways. Over mm -hmm. time, there and there are a lot of private roads in town, and roads that you may be surprised are private roads just because everybody drives on them. Um, the uh, over time, the town has started to plow some private roads, and now we're sort of pulling back from that. That was something we should not be doing. We don't have, you know, mm -hmm. we. we I think the private road owners don't want us to damage their roads. If we damage it, we're responsible, things like that. Mm -hmm. So we're starting to do that. We didn't, we didn't, we're not doing that all at once. We're sort of doing it sort of, you know, as we get through, you know, sort of give people ample notice that the town will stop plowing this private road at this mm -hmm. point. Um, so it's it's not it's not clean, clear cut like that, but mm -hmm. ultimately a private road is a private road and, and where the public way is very defined and mm -hmm. um and I think that that's where, if you're going to go to a bylaw that separates between whatever's under your property you're responsible for, then that's actually a fairly easy thing. Mm -hmm. um, so, but you mean yes. that, that that if it's a private road, that is deemed the responsibility that's owned by the person who lives there. Right. Okay, that seems easy, isn't mm -hmm. to me? Actually, it's not that easy. Uh, because I guess there, what I've learned in the finance committee discussions about um, Kester Lane and uh, the the adjoining um, Hopbrook, those were built um, according to the standards that require that are required for a private road to be accepted once the uh, subdivision is completely built as a public road, I think where Shalini lives is the same thing, that they were built by the builder to town specifications um, so that they could be converted mm -hmm. over. Okay. And, um, as I understand it, if, if I understood Guilford correctly, and I think I had it all, then mm -hmm. uh, we're still plowing those roads that were built to standard and the intent is that they would eventually become um, public ways, but those are the only private roads that we're plowing. Mm -hmm. hmm. That's where we're that's where we're going to go, but we are we had been plowing other roads as well. And that's where we're getting out of that business. Mm -hmm. And I guess that the other thing that I would just point out is is that the point that that um one person who wrote to the council, who I've actually had some direct communications with, was making is that uh, if something happens to her water line from her house, and if she has to be responsible all the way out to Old Farm Road, that that's a, a tremendous cost. And she was suggesting that the regulation ought to provide mm -hmm. from your house to the point of the nearest public way, and to uh, and, and and so that becomes a problem. So she wants to have it moved to property line, and that's not something that either committee thought about. Mm -hmm. when we uh, had our previous discussions. So I, um, it's sort of this hanging piece. And I think that that's what my discussion with uh, Amy Rusecki was uh, about, was that uh, uh, when it came down to it, uh, we hadn't thought about it. I'm not sure that she's fully, had fully explored it either. And now there's a scramble to figure out something that wasn't in the bylaws that was developed. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Shall I end this up? Yeah, thank you. Um, thanks, Anna, for doing this because I was uh, I didn't want us to leave it dangling, as you pointed out, if you don't have a clear motion that requires uh, the town manager to look into this. So I'm glad you're doing this. Um, my clarification question was, Paul, about um, what Guilford had said about UMass and the big build apartment buildings and i didn't under he said that was private and i didn't understand does that mean that if you were to move towards a town taking over the cost of repair for anything that's on 
public road but belongs to the property owner the town will be responsible so for umass and the big apartment buildings who you know where will who will be uh, responsible for the repair on public path yeah so again the cleanest line is if it's in the public way or not and um you know so those apartment buildings all maintain their own water lines and, and sewer lines um and, and and so you know like hampshire college has a very long driveway that's all their property uh, people drive through there all the time, but it's still their property. Um, UMass is a little bit different because it is a government agency. You know, it's a government, built, but we don't take responsibility for the the uh, material for their um, for their property. So, so just, just to be clear, that even if we changed to the town taking over any breakage or repairs happening on public part of the profit, not profit public park, public mm -hmm. path roads, yep. then we would not be responsible for those apartment buildings or UMass. Correct. As long as we said we're taking responsibility for what's in the town public way. Once we expand beyond that to go on private ways, like on what Andy was talking about, then it opens up a big, a lots of different questions. But if we're from what is envisioned at this moment is that we stay, that it's being written that we will take it over or I assume we'll be taking it over just the public way part of it. Okay, but even if we take, so right now the way it is, if a breakage happens in the public way that belongs to UMass. No, it's that still would UMass, That's still UMass. It would be UMass. And apartment yeah. buildings? Still the private property owner. Yeah, so that would change then, right? If we did no. change it now? But you're saying no. if it's public way, then right now, if their pipe is going into public way, they are still responsible the way it is right now. Correct. But if we changed it, then if their pipe went into public way, then the town would be would have to fix it. Just for the part that would be in the public way. Public way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it could be 10 is, feet, right? Yeah, yeah, just for the part that's in the public way. But still, yeah. what I mean is we're taking over the big apartment buildings break it if it's in the public way or are you saying it will never be in the public way and so we, it's not a problem well, one of the things we should recognize and i just from my just all the work i've done over the years a mm -hmm. lot of those roads through umass that people think are public actually belong to the university they don't belong to the town okay. uh, north pleasant street eastman lane for example uh, big part of fearing street uh, I think a good part of uh, University Drive as you approach the university. And I don't know where the lines are exactly, but I know that a lot of those roads are actually university owned and maintained roads, not town owned maintained roads. But can we just please clarify again? So, right now, are there any pipes? of the apartment buildings that go into the public way or do they end in their own property? When you say apartment buildings, what do you mean? Yeah. The bigger apartment buildings downtown that are rented or any, it's not just downtown, like South Amherst or anywhere. East, where East there Hadley are, Road. East Hadley Road. Oh, yeah. Okay. So, so, yeah. So right now, everybody's responsible up to the main line. Whoever Whoever's pipe that is, is responsible up to the main line. Mm -hmm. And I think what the council is contemplating is, or it, is that we would be responsible, the town would take responsibility from the main line to the end of the public way. And then from the public way to the property, you know, that would, then it turns into pri private property and then it goes to their building, whatever it is. So for instance, the boulders, that's all private land back there. It, mm -hmm. it, it, it stops at East Hadley Road. All those roads for those apartment complexes are private. That helpful or not? I guess I'm not clear. Okay, so there's a main to to the public way, you know, and then onto the public way. Is that how it works? So there's the main in the prop on their property, and then the pipe goes uh, in their own private land, and then we are saying we want to take over any pipeline that goes beyond into public way, right? And right yeah. now, 
is it are we is the town right now the way it is is the town responsible for any breakage that happens in the public way for those apartment buildings no it isn't right and we want to change that to the town taking over and that's my concern that the town will have to take over the built apartments repairs of lines in the public way no can I sorry yeah, well, Anna, Anna, go ahead. wants to clarify yes but we're not talking about this anymore because we already sorry that's not shutting you down but like we aren't making we already made the decision of what the regs are going to be and so like we decided not to change that um on Monday that was the vote Monday so nothing is changing about the ownership of the lines at this point nothing it's staying the way that it currently is no, but the questions we are asking is to make that decision in the future. So we have to ask the questions accordingly so that the reason we didn't make it now is not because we're not interested in making the change. The reason we didn't make it is because we don't have enough information in order to make that change in two years. So give me a, let me finish my paragraph really quickly. So what I'm saying is that I don't actually think it's helpful for us to kind of debate what was going to be that in in the regs right because we discussed that like back in i don't even remember what month it was i think and and because i know that we want to get to universal composting and everything today so what i want to maybe kind of bring us back to is what what questions you want to ask and and whether and what you were talking about might be that question right of saying mm -hmm. that you you want clarity on exactly where ownership changes oh, um but the the I guess I'm not sure that it's it's helpful right now to totally rehash what the changes were going to be because what what we might come up with or what whoever the council in two years might come up with might look totally different. Um, so I think that it's helpful not to go into it maybe with an entire plan in mind and instead think about what you need to know if you were going to change ownership, right? Regardless of where that ownership change happened, it kind of what information would you need? Because I think the problem that Andy was referring to is saying that we didn't have all of the information. So I, I kind of want to move us back even a step to think about what is the information that we want to have in order to better understand that um, decision. Okay, just to clarify, I wasn't trying to rehash what that discussion, but I'm trying to understand what the situation is so I can articulate the question, but I can do it offline. I don't need to spend time right now. Okay. Thank you, Sean. And Dorothy, your hand is up. Yeah. Well, I do think that we, we do need to clarify something. We have to know where we've been before we know where we're going to go. And my understanding is, and this is where Shalini's having a problem, my understanding is that our proposal, as it was written, did not have any change contemplated for town taking over piping of of UMass or private parking apartment complexes. So just checking with Paul on that. That so that worry that Chalini had was not in the original proposal. Is that correct? Yeah, and and so there and there is no change of ownership under the new regs because the council voted that on Monday. There's not right. going to be any change. Every it's status quo on ownership. Right. So we're, we're going to build the regulations around that. Right. So we okay. didn't give UMass or apartment buildings special privilege. They are not town land, so they would not get covered because it's not town land. Mm -hmm. We would only deal with whatever is buried on town land. Good. Okay, any other questions on this topic? All right, so we are going to move on to the proposed amendments to bylaw 3.33, refuse collection and recyclable materials. Um, as we all know, this is a multi-layered one here. So we have a, a, a three part. We will open with a, an update from Paul. We will have, following that, we will have a, an additional public comment. If we have anyone at that moment who would, at that time rather, who would like to make a comment. And then we will be passing the floor to council sponsor lead Shalini for a committee discussion and questions. Um, I believe we will have in the audience expert Susan Waite, and we will have um, advocates from Zero Waste. At least I know that is um, Darcy Dumont. I'm not sure if others are in the audience or are coming in. Welcome if you are. Uh, so with that, I want to hand the floor over to Paul. Great, thank you. 
So Guilford and uh, Susan Waite and I met and we sort of laid out a plan of action for her time. As you know, we have a grant of 80 hours of her time. Uh, she had expressed interest in attending tonight. I don't see her in the audience, but she's welcome. I told her she's welcome to attend and be our, as, our, as our government expert. Um, what her, what the plan of action, well, the goal is to issue a request for information to the haulers who might potentially bid on the town of Amherst um, um, services and collect information about what kind of services they provide. We want to get a picture of the universe of haulers and the services that they provide so that as the council starts to talk about this, the services it wants, we can sort of overlay the two things. Like, is that even a possibility? Well, there, is there someone out there who would provide that service or not? If, if we go for one bidder. So that's sort of the, the mission on this. Uh, Susan is going to her, she's got a sort of a 15 week um, schedule for moving this forward. She's going to draft the potential RFI request for information questions. Um, she's going to, um, then Guilford will review and edit the RFI questions. Uh, Susan is also going to be trying to identify all the potential vendors out there who could be interested in, in you know, and we want to cast as, as wide a net as possible so we can send this, this, this questionnaire basically is what it is out to lots of vendors. Um, within three weeks, uh, she thinks that she can finalize and issue the RFI. One other task in there is for me to double check all the procurement laws and make sure that we're not violating any procurement laws, blah, blah, blah. Um, the, the, um, we are allowing three to four weeks for the vendors to respond to these questions. She felt, felt that that was a reasonable amount of time. It should not be a complicated thing, but since it's not actual business they're bidding on, they may not prioritize it because we're just collecting information. Um, there would be a, an opportunity. <coughs> I'm not sure exactly how this fits in with the procurement law, so we need to check it. We'd like to bring in anybody who's interested to come to a meeting where they can, where people can ask questions or they can ask questions of us. What are we seeking? So they can fully inform their responses. Um, Susan will then review, analyze, and uh, uh, you know, develop a, a report on the responses um, and then meet with the TSO committee to start talking about, here's the information we have. What are the next steps in the development of, uh, of this proposal? Um, we assume that that includes some community engagement sessions um, and and whether if we can, I would love to be able to use her time efficiently so she can participate in those with us because I think she would be invaluable in being part of that community engagement process. Um, so that's sort of how we've laid it out. She, ha she has cautioned us several times about, she has other things on her plate. She's got vacations planned during the course of these next three months. So. She's, we're sort of mapping all those things through so that when she goes on vacation, the stuff is out into the vendor's hands and they have time to get, and also trying to manage everything um, so that we're not eating up all of her time on things that she doesn't need to be paying attention to. So, um, and, th and then that, so come June is likely when it will come to the, back to TSO in terms of sh sharing the information that's been collected and then talking about how, where you want to go with this information and how it matches what you're talking about later on tonight. Does that make sense? Thank you. Are there questions for Paul? Anna, and then Shalini. Um, oh, Shalini's the sponsor. She can go, wasn't Shalini go first? No, no, go for it, go for it. Oh. Okay, I, I don't know if it's for Paul or for the sponsor, so I'm gonna kind of just put it out there. So in in doing my homework on this, um, one of the things I was reading was talking about best practices for municipal curbside pickup and all of that. And a lot of the really important elements of this are in the contract with the hauler yep. and not necessarily in the regulations. And so I'm curious, and that's not something to my understanding that council would be drawing up, I don't, think that we are in the practice, nor should we be, of, of doing town contracts. But so I'm curious, things like pay structure or, or things like um, pricing schedules and, um, you know, how to navigate unexpected events. I was reading articles about, you know, when 
uh, when haulers went on strike and how to navigate mm. things like that. So I'm curious mm -hmm. about when might be a good point for us to give input on things that we would like to see in a possible contract and if that might impact the RFI um, at all, not obviously not having a contract that we're, you're going out with, but saying, you know, we would want to have input or we would want certain things um, yeah. to be in that contract. I so I think that... <laughs> You're right that that, can I respond to that? Please, please. Sure. Yeah. So, so that level of detail would be in an RFP and that's where the contracts are. And that's where there's a bevy of information out there because lots of communities have these contracts with, with haulers. And that's where that level of detail comes in the RFP process, not the RFI process. Right. Um, and that will, you know, we will put in a, when we do an RFP, we put an actual contract in the say, here's a contract we expect you to sign. And that's so everybody's way, way in advance of the bidding. They know exactly what we're talking about. Okay. And, and we would try to find the best, you know, do the best practice on that. Um, the RFI is mostly to say, um, do you do curbside recycling? Right. Uh, is it single stream or dual stream? Uh, do you need to use tot toters or not? You know, like uh, what, what are your expectations? And, and, and then give them some flexibility, like, can you do it or is that your prefer preferred way to do it? And try to just collect information from all the different haulers because we want, a lot of them have just standard business practices and they're not going to adjust just because we put out an RFP. So mm -hmm. we want to see what the, what the actual market is like and try to keep that as, as open as possible. So we, we, every, we, we want to, it's in our best interest to have a lot of people bid on this because mm -hmm. that will drive the price. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Shall I? Um, so yeah, so thank you, Paul, for the update. That's really, really super helpful to get a lay down of the schedule. Um, the question I had was in terms of the staff person who'll be uh, leading this, is that Guilford you mentioned? At this moment, it's still is Guilford. We've talked about having another person do it and um, Steve Taliga, who runs the transfer station. Mm -hmm. um, Guilford's having that conversation. You know, Susan works with Steve as well. And they, you know, so we, in terms of who that person is, we haven't really settled on that at this point. Okay. And then um, in terms of the RFI, would, I'm hoping we also get, get a sense of the cost, like, and maybe at different levels, like if they're composting yard waste, this might be the cost, or if they're going to do just, you know, so we have all these different, because that's the yep. huge big question is what is it going to cost? Yeah. So we don't, we didn't think that they would actually tell us what they think they wouldn't tell us what they would bid. So we <laughs> asked them, we're going to ask them what communities they already service. What uh -huh. is the cost of the services they provide in that service? Um, there's some, Susan was wondering if they would even share that level of information. But if we have the the communities that they already serve, yeah. how many households are in that, commu that community? Our um, profile of households is different than a lot of communities. And so Guilford has actually broken it down into, or his team, I think Susan actually worked on this project when she first started here. Like how many single families, how many double, two families? Because it, it's not, we have lots of large apartment complexes, doesn't exactly match up with what people expect. Mm -hmm. And the more information we give to haulers, the better they're gonna be at pricing. All right. Andy. I actually set her hand up longer, so I... I've already talked, if you want to go ahead, Andy. Well, both, we both have. <laughs> I mean, okay. Um, Anika, is it okay if I go? Go right ahead. You two decide. So, so I was looking, it's because we wore matching outfits today, Andy. That's what it is. Um, so the... One of the steps in the action plan talked about um, benchmarking against other communities. And I'm curious, I understand that the haulers won't give you a price, but are you going to be reaching out or are the sponsors going to be reaching out to other communities in the area to learn more about their costs? And I, I'm sure we all read, or if we haven't, I recommend it, the article in the Gazette last week or two weeks ago about South Hadley and their trash hauler contract. Um, and you know how much I, the costs have gone up and the way that they run it. And it was, I mean, they, they dug on Amherst a little bit, which I didn't love yeah. in the end. That was not cool. But uh, <laughs> other than that, it was really interesting uh, the, the way that they actually really broke down the fees. And so I'm curious what, in addition to reaching out to the haulers, what questions we are asking of other towns and if that outreach has happened and who is doing it. 
And if there's an opportunity for us to have input on what questions are asked, I don't necessarily have any on top of mind, but maybe we can come up with some interesting ones. So we are, we have not done the, we have, if Susan has, uh, Susan knows a lot of the, the environment that she is the regional rep. She collects all the contracts. I think she is really our subject matter expert on this. We all can reach out and talk to individuals, but I think relying on her as our person, which is another reason to try to be um, efficient with her time. Um, and and that's, that's information we can use as a town, we can easily collect from, from their DPWs or whoever is in charge of it. Thank you, Lana. You covered some of my questions as, as well. And thank you. Oh, and, and if you have questions you think should be asked for sure, please send them to me. You know, mm -hmm. it's very early in the process. Right. Andy. Okay, so um, there's several levels that we've talked about because we talked about what's in the bylaw, talked about what's in the RFP that will be issued by on the staff level. And then there's a question that we haven't really talked about as to what goes in the regulations and who's responsible for the regulations. And in fact, it might be, uh, I think we need an investigation, as Paul knows the answer for sure, it may be required that it be the Board of Health. And that may be a state statute. Um, and so as a consequence, uh, you know, I think that we need to think about that and going back to just our general experience and other discussions, <clears throat> that you don't want to put more in the bylaw than you have to because it's such a uh, difficult process to amend bylaws and uh, why okay. council engage in that time over um, things that need to be changed on a more frequent basis. So uh, part of our structuring of this uh, whole enterprise, both as a practical and as a legal matter is, you know, what goes into each of those three buckets. Thank you, Andy. Shalini, your, yeah, your hand is up, Shalini. Thank you. Yeah, I think we're naturally going into the next part of the conversation, which is the purpose of today's meeting was to collect all of these questions and so that we can send it to Paul and then he can distribute it to staff or other committees or Board of Health and uh, Susan so that uh, it might help Susan in crafting the RF, RFI. And um, the other part is I see this as a two step process where we are first looking at mainly getting the RFI done uh, or Susan getting it done so that TSO and Finance Committee has more information to really dive into the issues that are going to uh, impact residents. And, and, and that's going to help us craft the bylaw. And then the second phase is the writing of the regulations. Um, which again, the Board of Health, I believe, has made it clear they don't have the bandwidth to write the regulations. So that is something that, Paul, you might have to guide us who, mm -hmm. you know, do you need, yeah, a separate committee working with Susan, with the staff? Is it going to be town staff and Susan and TSO? Like, yeah, so that's a, that's a question out there that's going to be sent to you. Mm -hmm. To answer it Perfect. Perfect. Andy? Yeah, this is just a follow up on what you just said, Shalini. Uh, I might as well just uh, say it uh, since it's out, it's out there anyway. My wife was chair of the Board of Health for a number of years. Um, and so uh, some of my knowledge about what I said on regulations came out of just us talking about it. And what she recollects from her time on the Board of Health was that staff would come in with recommendations and then they would just be reviewed and adopted by the board, that the board did not write regulations, that uh, staff had very, uh, were, were very involved in writing the regulations. And I would think that that's likely, and, and I can understand 
uh, the uh, board, current board's hesitation about being put in a position of writing regulations, I think that uh, it would really require the, that kind of staff assistance. Again, Shalini and, and Paul. Paul would like to respond. Sure. Um, so I think I think um, all those statements are correct. Um, at the time this came to the Board of Health, I think it was in November, December, something like that. They were like they were just had so many things on their plate. They were like, we can't take this on. Mm -hmm. But if we're looking at something more spaced out over the year, I can help talk with the health director. And if there's staff support that is needed, we can certainly supply supply that. But that is typically the process as staff drafts stuff, something reviews it with the Board of Health. And typically, I think um, these regulations would live with the Board of Health. Um, so I don't think that you should take that response from December whenever they were working on it um, uh, as forever. Thank you, Paul. Shalini? Yeah, I just wanted to acknowledge uh, that Susan Wade is in the audience. And I don't know if uh, we'd like to invite her, Paul, in sure. as a panelist. Yes, absolutely. And while we're waiting for Susan to join us, um, I think um, I just wanted to go over what uh, with Andy as the other sponsor and uh, you know we had we already had a very in-depth conversation early on where we created that very detailed chart that broke down questions under three broad categories the first one being moving to a town contracted hauling system what are the questions I'm sorry I'm sorry to interrupt Sean it be right just right before we uh, pass the floor over to you hello Susan welcome Susan, uh, we did promise that there would be one other public comment so I just want to offer that even though we don't have it and then we'll sure. hand the floor over to you so if there is any other public comment would you please raise your hand Okay. All right. I do not see anyone. All right. So Shalini, the floor is yours. All right. Thank you. Welcome, Susan. Thank you for being with us. Um, uh, so just to go over what our goal was for today, that um, we've had one extensive or a couple of extensive conversations earlier on where we uh, divided what's before us into three broad buckets. And we looked at questions under all of those. Uh, the three broad categories were we're moving towards a town contracted hauling system. Secondly, we want a goal is to reduce trash using a paid model, pay as you throw model. So what are the questions within that? And the third was around universal composting to include, you know, what are the questions related to universal composting? So that was one way we collected and thought about the questions we need to answer. And within those questions, most of them, Susan, are gonna be directed towards you and the staff. Um, and the goal is to collect those questions and send it to you and the staff to see how, and that can help you shape the RFI and, and with your knowledge, if you can answer some of the questions independent of the RFI, so that's one thing. The second thing that I was proposing is that those questions are so extensive. And Paul, did you want to say something before I go on? No, when you're finished, I, I just want to orient Susan to where we are. Yeah, okay. And so the second uh, way of approaching the questions was to say that, okay, if we had a certain bylaw language, this is not the final bylaw language. However, to bring that lens to look at the questions and decision points before us, as TSO. So that was the purpose of looking at the bylaw and seeing what are the decision points and what questions are coming up through that lens. And, you know, having a discussion around that and then collecting those questions and sending it to Paul and Susan. So that's where we are. And Paul, did you want to? Yeah. So Susan, just so you know, we, we've had a somewhat of a discussion already about, I reviewed with them the timeframe and the sort of process for the RFI and the 
the timing of that over the next 15 weeks or whatever it is that we laid out um, and what you will be bringing back to the TSO at, you know, at the conclusion of that process that we are open to hearing any questions that the counselors would like to include on an RFI as, as you start to build that. And just so, so we, I think everybody sort of squared away with what, what's going to happen with the RFI portion of this conversation, just so you know, we've had that conversation and, they, and they're aware of what you, the timing that you sort of laid out for everybody. Great. Thank you, Paul. And uh, Susan, if you have any questions for us as a TSO and anything that would be helpful to you along the way to uh, create the RFI and do this project, just feel free to raise your hand and ask us those questions. Uh, with that, I would like to open up to the TSO members. If you uh, had a chance to look at the bylaw and through that lens or any other lens, have any questions, we already started uh, putting some questions forward, which I've recorded, but please also send them to me and then I can collect all of these questions, including our initial set of questions um, and then compile them and send them to Susan. And plus, I'll also send it, include that in a copy in our own TSO so we know what questions are being sent out. But for now, if anyone has uh, additional questions in addition to what has already been raised. Um, Susan, do you want to go first? Sure. Hi, everybody. I just want to be clear when you were when you're talking about questions and generating questions from the group and the public, are these questions about the concept in general, or are they questions for the the potential vendors in the RFI? Yeah. So the questions are around three main buckets, which are related, like. We're going to send them to you and then you can see which ones are related to the RFI because some I things see. like some things will be questions like what goes into composting, uh, right. you know, and so what is the definition of composting and what will be allowed and is it going to include lawn lawn uh, waste or whatever lawn land lawn stuff? yard waste yard waste yes or is it just food waste and so in my mind I'm imagining getting a response for different categories and different costs and being able to offer that, but I don't know. So anyway, so those are the kind of, and there are many, many such questions. Some of them will be going towards creating, maybe create, crafting the RFI, that's up to you. And mm -hmm. some will go into other committees, like who is gonna write the regulations, how are they gonna be enforced, um, uh, things like that. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. And Anna, you had your hand up. Yeah, so my questions, I had one simple one that you might be able to answer right now. Um, looking at the non-criminal disposition at the top, what does responsible personnel mean? What, who does, is that your intended staff person? Or is there someone else? I just wasn't clear on who that was. That can be a question to Paul. <laughs> oh, I thought you had put it in there. It was an, it was an edit in red, so I wasn't sure who put it in and what the intention was when they- so the, and so the, none of, Okay, so this bylaw is written as a sort of a model for what it could look like and what are the kind of things that go into it, but none of it is uh, set. And those are the questions we need answered in order to finalize who is going to be that person. I see. Uh, yeah. Okay, so my question is who's enforcing? Yeah. Um, that's that's uh, easy enough. Yeah. Um, really? oh, sorry, go okay. ahead. No, I'm, I'm not going to answer. You, um, we're collecting questions. I'm sorry. If yeah. you have an answer, I'd love to hear it. I, I think that I was just confused because I, I didn't know what that meant when I was reading through and I, I didn't quite understand how the, um, I, I think I, yeah, okay. Um, and then my other, I mean, I think for me, really the questions, it's hard to differentiate which questions are about bylaw and which questions are about regs and which questions are about contracts, right? And so mm -hmm. I think ultimately for me, what this comes down to is the 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 cost of it, right? And how that um, how that impacts the decision. And, and it's hard because, you know, you can't do an RFP if, unless we've really started moving forward on all the other elements. And it's really hard to commit to moving forward on the other, other elements without knowing how much it costs. And so I feel like, 
you know, I, I know that I'm not alone and feeling stuck in a little bit of this laundry machine here, but um, I'm really excited about this. And I, I'm, I would really love to see for me, the, the, the part I'm really looking forward to seeing is the benchmarking from other towns, as well as the results of that RFI in terms of um, what's available and cost. And then my last question is again, not necessarily in, in the bylaw, but I'd really like to know um, where the waste would go and what level of control we would have as a town over where that way, both compost waste and recycling and trash, um, where those where those three would end up. Um, and what is the sphere of control the town has over that? For example, I saw a sample bylaw from another town that if the um, refuse was not brought to the agreed upon location, there was a $2 per pound fee fine to the, to the hauler. Um, and so I think that, you know, those are, those are questions that I'd like to ask last one. And I know I'm getting picky and I know that this is part of the contract stuff. Um, I want to, you know, one of the main, there are many reasons to do this. Um, and one of them is to improve, uh, is to, to work towards our climate action goals. And I'd like to know what we can put into the, um, I guess, again, I'm talking about the contract. I think I might be going down the wrong avenue constantly here, Paul, sorry. But uh, <laughs> with the contract, I'd like to know what we can do to ensure that we are um, contracting with someone who's really hitting best practices with regards to sustainability um, and in terms of their vehicles, in terms of their practices, in terms of all of that. So those, those are vague and broad and I can try to be more specific and I will stop talking for a little bit and come up with 10 more for you. Yeah, I think those are right on. And because one of the goals of moving to this is not just universal composting, but also reduction of waste and bringing more transparency and control vis-a-vis uh, -vis the haulers. And when we spoke with some of the haulers uh, at the MMA, they were very clear that it's not just about who's going to, which hauler is going to charge the lowest price but it is about what information and data they're gonna to provide to you. And that's what we, are, and I don't know if that's a question for y'all. Mm -hmm. uh, and if we can write that into the RFI, like what sort of information are they gonna to provide to us? Because this one particular hauler is like, we are able to tell this town, this is how much uh, waste we were able to take away from the landfills. And that's very good mm -hmm. motivating information, I think for the public to know that this is worth something. It is making a difference when we get that kind of data. And Anna, did you have a follow up question? I'm going to have a lot more. Please run through. Okay, so, okay, so are you going to put your hand down? And then I think after that was maybe Andy. I can't see the order. I'm just trying to remember, but Andy. Let's let's not go back to the sponsors right away. So okay. go to Dorothy and Nick. Okay, and uh, yeah, sure. So, Dorothy? Perhaps because I've been attending a lot of zoning meetings lately, but I'm feeling in a very practical mood. And um, rather than us writing the absolute perfect piece of legislation or at least giving guidelines for it, I would like to see some actual contracts that exist in town that are still saying it's okay. Because I think that we're going to be trading off some services and price at various times. And I think we want to we want to be in the real world. This is what a company is actually doing now in a town, and that they say that they're more or less doing what they say they're supposed to be doing. Um, and then we'll have to make some choices. I don't think we can get everything we want. And uh, I'm, I guess I'm feeling. I really like the idea of staff writing the writing the proposal, for example. I don't think that we counselors should be doing minutia of technical contracts. Um, my husband used to write contracts for the board of estimate. That was that's what he did. OK, he didn't do all the other stuff that we do. Um, it's very technical and it requires a lot of expertise and practical and talking to people with practical real world knowledge. So I, I'm. I'd love to see that. And I don't know, Paul, is that something that you might do? Actually look to see what kind of contracts exist out there? Um, what people I think, yeah, I think Susan has a whole uh, room full of contracts. <laughs> good, 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 wonderful. Yeah, thank you. And just to clarify, Dorothy, I think the, the bylaw that we're proposing is definitely not in any way suggesting that this is what we're starting with. It is just to provide a lens and like 
we had all those set of questions earlier, but when I put in the uh, lens of a bylaw before me, there were additional questions that came up, which we hadn't thought through when we were just generally exploring. So it's just like looking at this issue in different ways. And then once we get the information, we're going to probably end up writing it from scratch and it'll be a completely different bylaw. So yes. Uh, Anika? Well, I was about to lower my hand because most of my questions that I had from this evening have been raised and I did submit the rest. But I'm not sure on what I submitted if I had asked about um, different models that, um, and specifically that maybe the zero waste in the town had looked at, and if um, the name I can't remember, but a this has probably been shared with everyone in Chalney. You probably remember the name. There's a a group out of Greenfield um, mm -hmm. that deals with recycling wasting and how and and it just what I what I thought was interesting was who they employ. They give those second chances and even somehow work into, you know, helping folks with, with housing. And I just thought that was a uh, fascinating idea um, and, and aligned with uh, many of the goals that we, you know, have as a, as a town and council. So I wanted to know, um, like, were there different models being looked at in terms of how this is playing out? And to just build on what Aniko is saying, this is the Greenfield Cooperative. They might have a different name, but they uh, make use the higher uh, incarcerated people, people who've just come out of uh, jail. I don't know how to say it, but anyways, so it's a very interesting model for compost pickup. However, they then, at least from the website, what it looks like is they then utilize other uh, composting uh, places like Martin's and all of those to do do it, but they do the pickup. So, but I really appreciate your question that, you know, how can just to keep a lookout for all the different models out there for composting. Oh, sorry. Andy, do you want to go for, um, and then I can come back to Anna? I can. Uh, I just was going to go through real quickly what the questions were that the sponsors had identified some months ago mm -hmm. and uh, just to put them out on the table and then uh, I think we need to still be talking about them. The first two I'm not even going to spend time on because they were kind of the, if this system doesn't work, what's the alternative and how is the alternative really workable because we don't think it's working now so we, we asked uh what better regulations of haulers to the current system might achieve uh, any of the other goals well yeah uh, we think we're trying we're, we're starting from the presumption that that's not the best way to, the best approach to take the other ones were when i get beyond those two what additional town staff would be needed um for the to implement the system and how would those individuals be funded? Who would sign up households? Who would do the billing and accounting? Who would handle complaints that the hauler doesn't resolve? And that sort of creates an assumption that uh, our subscribers uh, are who are going through the town system would first try and solve problems. With the hauler who in the uh oh, we don't really know that does the town regulate uh materials to be recycled and how is uh it going to be enforced which was kind of alluded to earlier today how do we monitor compliance of customer so customers participate in either hauler contract or use the transfer station because we don't want to have, um, I presume, anybody who's not doing one of the two. Um, what if there's no acceptable bids? What are we going to do? You know, if you set up a statute, you've got to be thinking about that possibility. What is the role of transfer station and how do we assure that it's sustainable to keep it running? Uh, 
So those were the kinds of uh, the questions that we had thought about with uh, the the structure. Then with getting to the as you throw thing, we thought about. Um, and I'm not even sure we want to call it pay as you throw, but it's certainly paying by the amount of waste you, you dispose of through uh, anything other than recycling. What are the different ways to implement the system and what are the pros and cons of each? Uh, and it, you know, it sort of raises the question of selling bags or uh, pricing by size of container or both. Uh, yeah, I shouldn't for uh, what what happens in uh, if somebody has additional trash in a week, then they've paid for if you're not going to uh, do it as bags. Um, understand uh, the costs to service routes and uh, So, you know, just getting an understanding of the system, I think, is what, because we, we really are not experts in uh, choosing um, the, when, when Anna was talking about choosing where the trash goes, and how does that, and, but I think we really have an interest in at least understanding it. Um, <laughs> Should there be a provision for bulky objects? Uh, we know that uh, students at the end of the year have lots of furniture they get rid of. And uh, there's been a lot of complaints that it's not really a very good system now. And it ends up getting dumped in all sorts of odd places. And then our DPW is picking it up now and not knowing even who's has to bear the costs so the town ends up bearing the cost of doing that. So is there anything that we want to do to address that problem? Uh, and just knowing how the whole system is being monitored. And uh, then I think the other thing I, I thought about was in our list is that in addition to enforcement, there's education. Is you have to tell people, you have to make sure you're educating people. And then there's that whole series, which I'm not going to go into. There were about half a dozen questions on composting. I think they've been largely alluded to already this evening. So there's a, you know, there, there already was in that document that I sent out and added this afternoon. When you look at that last column, you see the questions, which is why I didn't feel I needed to read them all. Uh, but uh, that those are the kinds of things, uh, Susan, that I think that we've been thinking about, and um, we don't know if the answers are going to come through the RFQ pro uh, process that we're talking about. But you know the answers to some of the questions, um, or can guide us to where we get it, or you can just tell us, well, you don't need to know this because. I guess that's, uh, I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Andy. Um, and uh, Susan, just so you know that we are going to send you this whole list of questions. So please don't feel like you might miss something. Uh, did you want to say something before I go to Anna or? Uh, sure. I just wanted to say that in terms of comparison with other communities, um, Paul, as Paul indicated, uh, we have, I have access to quite a few contracts. We have access to tons and tons and tons of data. So if you want to know what the cost per household is for um, a curbside system in, in, you know, 15 different communities, we can figure that out. And we can figure it out over the course of, you know, the last 10 years or more. So there's lots of data that's out there to to help compare ourselves or to estimate approximately how much it would be per household um, with certain services. I mean, you know, it's, it's not gonna be an apple to an apple, but it's gonna be, there's lots of approximation information. So I also wanna just quickly say that in terms of where your, where your trash goes, 
um, we're, we're really limited by choices right now. So we're, we're not necessarily going to have um, lots of options. So it would, but that being, after, that being said, we have the right to know where our trash is going. And if the, we have preferences about how it's handled, you know, that would be certainly something to put in an RFQ. RFP, I'm sorry. Thank you, Susan. That's really helpful. Um, and it really helps us to think about like once you're, we'll send you the questions and hopefully they help you craft the RFI. And, and then once that is crafted and sent, then we can maybe while we're waiting for the callers, then we can work with you and uh, looking at other contracts or other data to start doing some of the discussion and so forth. Uh, Anna. Thank you. Um, also want to give Shalini a shout out because I believe you had CRC right before this. So you're on our like seven of meetings. Um, so anyway, thank you. Uh, really two things really quickly. One, you know, I think that for me, I, I'm very clear that we are not the ones writing the actual contract. I think the questions that I'm posing here are more of what I'd like to see us consider as we, as we move forward. I don't know specifics of what should be said about it, but, um, and Susan, I really appreciate that insight about that being less applicable in our area about the locations being less applicable in our area that's really that's really helpful um the other thing i would add to the list is um hauling from different types of buildings and that's not the right way to phrase that but as we talked about before we in amherst are not only we have a large uh segments of our town that might have private hauler contracts already um and so figuring out um, if those buildings wanted to switch to a, a town pay as you throw, is that possible? Is that a, how would that work if large ap apartment complexes wanted to do that? Um, but also making sure that this does kind of layer nicely with our zoning. Um, so thinking through single family, multifamily uh, apartment buildings, regardless of what that is. Um, and it might be a moot point if, if larger complexes are going to stay with their own private haulers. But just ensuring that we have the flexibility to be able to serve all of the different types of locations that have refuse in our town. Thank you, Anna. Paul? Yes, yeah, so I think this is a really helpful conversation. I think the reason the RFI is important is it might reveal things that just aren't question, aren't options for us. So I talked to one hauler who said, we're not doing bags anymore. The industry is not, you know, if you don't use toters, we're not bidding, you know, because it's too much you know, personnel on, we need two people on a truck instead of one with a automated, you know, if you if we're gonna require any new business to have toters. So we might have a big conversation about pay as you throw bags versus toters. And it might not even be relevant in terms of there's no bidders out there for bags. And so I think the RFI will reveal some of that information for us. So that's just one example. So this is really excellent for us, thank you. Thank you, Paul. And thank you, Anna, for that um, transitioning or what, how do we include the different types of uh, resident dwellings that we have. So that's definitely an important question. If does anyone else have, otherwise I can read through some of the other counselor questions that we've received looking from the lens of the bylaw because Andy's already gone through what we already had discussed earlier. Um, so um, many of them have actually already been covered, like the definition of um, compostable, what should that include? And then the regulations will have more specific things like invasive species, like do are we, if you're collecting yard waste, do we allow invasive species to be thrown into it or not? Or what are the sizes of branches and whatnot? So that's more of a regulations thing, of course. Um, we do need to engage a little bit with uh, Board of Health, and we can find out in what way to do that, just to keep them informed as a courtesy also that this is where we are, what we're doing. Um, we already talked about who will write the regulations, uh, the starting date, what should the date for start be in the bylaw or and, and should it be in the bylaw or in the motion, like we originally we were anticipating 2024. 
but realistically, once we have Paul, is like, no. Yeah, so that's fine. That was just, we had to throw a date in. So we were just trying to be cool. But uh, I think once we have more information and we have a plan laid out at some point, we will have to come up with some sort of a plan for when this will be implemented. And, um, but at least from the sponsor side, I know Andy and I have spoken before, our hope really is that as a town, um, this particular council, we are able to at least do the whole process very thoughtfully, engage the public, get the information and have the bylaw piece of it at least finalized. And then the regulations can follow. Paul. It's, I'm sorry, I shook my head. Um, but the reason I, I did was that, and again, talking to haulers, and this is where an RFI would come into play, they would say, oh, there's 18 months wait for trucks. We cannot possibly. So that would be a piece of information that would inform the bylaw itself or wherever you put that date. So. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, that's interesting that we might be ready, but haulers are not ready to start. So that's that's another part. Uh, then a transport station, what is gonna be the, their role? Uh, is it sustainable to have? What role will they play? And it seems like a lot of people do use the transport station because it's a cheaper option, but we're hoping that the new con townwide contracted system is going to bring down prices and more people will you know, opt into this new system, but we don't know that. So that's another question out there. What role will the transfer station play? Uh, do we provide, make uh, composting mandatory or do we leave it optional? And of course I have my preference, and, but that's a discussion again that needs to happen. Um, Dorothy, did you wanna? add something oh it just reminded me um one reason we use the compost uh, we use the tra transfer station is that my husband likes to do that but the reason i like it, him to do it is not about money although it's i guess we're saving some is that i don't like to have buckets in front of my house and some of the houses around me have them there and they sit there a long time and so i find it unsightly so I am all for this pro this program because I know most people get their waste hauled and they're going to have buckets in front of their house anyway. But what the buckets look like and how quickly they're picked up is of interest to me because I don't I think it looks sloppy to have garbage pails in in the front of your house all at, all day long. Well, I wonder if we can throw in some aesthetics around that. I know Paul sent sent me a picture of Texas Austin. Those look pretty attractive. Those colors. With Paul. In my previous community, the service included going into your backyard, pulling the, the bucket, the toters out and loading them and then taking them back to your backyard. But they had to cut that back because it was so expensive. Wow. So level of you can pay for that. It's a service you can pay for. Right. It's what we we have to make it affordable and accessible to everyone. So, OK, and then uh, what is the order condos owner associations? How do we bring in more people? All of that. That question. Uh, um, what would it work out to have haul? Yeah, okay. And then billing and those sort of questions, the complaints, which Andy already covered. Uh, Anika, did I cover all the questions? I think I did. Um, so we submitted, uh, I think you did, including what has been discussed, but if you're going to if you're going to follow with an email just to make, just to be sure, mm -hmm. that would be helpful. Absolutely. And please, can you all send me your questions as well by in a week's time? Is that good enough for everyone to send me? And then I can compile all the questions and then send you all a copy and just don't reply all. And, and then I'll send a copy to Paul to share with Susan and staff. And Anna, did you have a question? It's half answered in my own head because it feels obvious. Um, mm -hmm. Just because of our conversation earlier, just ensuring that uh, private roads would be included in this or uh, making sure that that's part of it. Or not, I mean, but that that's the question, right? Mm, I think that's a question. I mean, it feels like they obviously would be because they're still residents but it's not the and it's not ma ma maintaining the public way which is what the like street lights and plowing would be but just to confirm that in private roads okay all right uh anika 
Oh, this this is for Paul. This might be a, a bit off topic, but you've got you intrigued me when you said that we would be surprised at some of the private roads. Could you just throw one out that you think people might be we would be most surprised to know as a private road? Um like Charles Lane off of Amity Street. Um there's a I don't know, remember the name, uh, right next to the high school uh that people used to use as a cut through mm -hmm. the name of that street and and then and people in the is a private road and, and they start putting up barriers so people wouldn't use it as a cut through. Um, mm. um, it, you know, that type of thing. Uh, it, um, the only street on the university campus that the town really owns is North Pleasant Street, uh, Massachusetts Avenue, uh, all the all the you know, that part of University Drive, Governor's Way, those are all university roads, um, obviously. Mm -hmm. uh, it's mostly smaller streets. Thank you. I've been curious since you said that. Thank you. So just last thing to wrap up, like I will collect, send me the questions in a week. I collect them, send them. And I also want to just share that the Zero Waste Amherst had done that town-wide survey of residents, which we, they were, I think in March, end of March, they said they will be compiling yet about 500 responses. So that's a good response, right? Knowing counselors, we know how hard engagement is so they will uh, come to uh, and make a presentation to TSO and will obviously send a copy they will be sending a copy to Susan with the results for their findings so that's on the agenda down the road and um, anything else otherwise I'm ready to transfer it back to Anika anything else you'd like to see happen in this conversation we will obviously have public um you know uh, hearings and things like that to include the public at the right time but right now there is not enough to share so thank you thank you shawnee and thank you susan for spending a good amount of your thursday evening with us <laughs> okay so we are there any announcements i actually do not have any today. Are there any announcements that anyone would like to share? We can allow Susan to leave if she, unless you want to say any last words to words of wisdom to us. <laughs> um, you know, I just thought of something a few minutes ago and mm -hmm. it left my head. Um, no, nothing's coming to mind. I wish I had some kind of beautiful statement to impress you all, but it's not going to happen. Oh, we are so impressed by you <laughs> already. <laughs> You've already said more than I expected. Actually, there were a couple of things that you said. Like, oh, really? So yeah. And well, and I, you, I just I want to say that um, I have not. I have while I have worked for the town of Amherst, I have not been involved with the governance part and. The more I learn about the work that you all do and the uh, passion and dedication that you do it with, the more impressed that I am. And so mm -hmm. thank all of you for the work that you do. Thank you, Susan. Thank you. Enjoy the rest of your evening. And, and Susan is speaking as a town resident as well. Yay, that's so yeah. wonderful. <laughs> Something nice. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, so we do have so some of our we have a meeting next week next Thursday and some of the uh, the future agenda items will be the surveillance use policy and then back to street lights. And with that, if there are no other comments or questions, we are adjourned. Good night, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Good night.